and um, uh, I got to tell you that that's the exact reverse of the truth. Um, uh, and uh, let me just give you the numbers. In 1997, 15, a little over 15 percent of Canadians were considered low income. By 2007, in other words, over the course of the decade I've just described, the proportion had decreased to 9.2 percent. It fell by nearly a third the number of people on low incomes in Canada. Uh, poverty rates.
that is to say, a center-left government in the form of President Bill Clinton and a center-right opposition in the form of Newt Gingrich and, uh, and the Republican majority in Congress. And that political configuration proved to be just as fruitful uh, in the United States as in Canada. Uh, you may recall that uh, one of the things that we did in Canada during our reform program was we, we fixed social welfare, as I've described. Uh, remember that this was the time when Bill Clinton signed a bill sent up from the Republican Congress to, as he said, uh, uh, end welfare as we've known it. Uh, we fixed uh, our uh, public pension entitlement program, the Canada Pension Plan, uh, an immensely difficult thing to achieve, but we did it. And if you read the memoirs now coming out of Washington, the people who were there at the time, it becomes very clear that Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich were on the eve of signing an agreement to reform Social Security in Washington. Uh, it could have been done, the deal was there to be had, uh, semen stained dresses intervened. Um, uh, and America lost focus. So um, when people say to me, well, you know, Canada's just a very different place, and you know, we could never achieve what you've done, I just, I, I'm sorry, I just don't find this at all convincing because you've already shown you can do it. Um, is the current political configuration in Washington um, similar to uh, the configuration that I've described in both Canada and the United States in the early 90s? I have no idea. Uh, that's something you know far more about than I do. Um, but I know that it, uh, uh, whatever the political configuration that's necessary, uh, uh, America faces today exactly the kind of challenges that Canada faced uh, in the early 19th and indeed, uh, some of your problems are even more profound than the ones that Canada has struggled with. I think Canada's experience, uh, the notion that leadership must come first from civil society, it is a mistake to say, oh well, it's those buggers in Washington, you know, they're, they won't fix the problem, so, you know, what can we do? That's not the American way in my experience, it's certainly not the Canadian way. The civil society in Canada took responsibility to change the climate in which these decisions were being made. We made it impossible for politicians to continue in the long run with, with decisions that uh, the average Canadian was convinced were irresponsible. So uh, it's not somebody else's problem, it was our problem, and I hope I'm not offending anyone if I say it's your problem. Um, uh, when we did that, uh, politicians came to the party uh, across the political spectrum, and uh, we were able to make enormous progress in a very short period of time. When the decision is made to turn the corner, you will be pleasantly surprised at how fast it can happen. Uh, but uh, somebody has to make the decision to make that happen. Let me just uh, conclude by talking very briefly about um, the details of how to do it. How do you achieve the kind of uh, uh, turnaround that I've described? talked a little bit about uh, civil society and uh, necessity to change the climate of public opinion, so let's take that as read. I think, uh, though, that there are some very important things that uh, governments need to bear in mind uh, as they figure out how to make the kind of uh, reductions in spending that are necessary, because I should tell you, by the way, um, that I, I noticed, for example, that uh, Governor Quinn here in uh, Illinois has recently announced that personal income taxes in the state are going to or like that. Um, uh, if, if you think I'm here to tell you that that's the right thing to do, you're going to be very bitterly disappointed. My view is that is not the right thing to do, and it is not what we did in Canada. There were some modest tax increases, but very small. Um, I, I have to tell you that uh, my experience, my experience of, uh, oh great, coffee's <laughs> uh, um uh, my experience and the experience of Canada is that more money in government coffers is only an excuse for politicians to spend on this. You cannot fix the problems I have described by raising more revenue. It is a spending problem. It is not a revenue problem. I would venture to say that America has enough money coming in to do the things that government needs to do in the United States. Its problem is that it can't control its spending. And uh, uh, new revenue is only an excuse not to control your spending. So, for what that's worth, uh, I, I throw that out to you. Uh, what you need to do in order to control spending is this. Uh, uh, you need to have an approach that says, we are asking
asking society as a whole to make, a, for every part of society, to make a fair contribution to fixing a problem that affects society. Everybody had a contribution to make to getting us into this problem. Everybody has a contribution to make to getting us out. Uh, and that means that uh, there cannot be any sacred cows. You know, there, every, every country has their political policy untouchables. You know, the, uh, the United Kingdom, they just elected a government uh, back in May that promised Canadian-style fiscal austerity to fix their budget problem. But it was a lie because the very first thing they did was they said, oh, and by the way, we're, to use their expression, we're ring-fencing foreign aid and the National Health Service. We won't look at them. We'll only look at other things. Um, our decision in Canada was that there would be no ring fencing, that everything that the government did had to be subjected to a stringent series of tests to make sure that it was actually delivering value to the public. So that doesn't mean that we cut everybody and every activity and every uh, job of government the same. We didn't. What we said was, let's look at every activity and determine whether it's something that really needs to be done and if it's something that only government can do. And through that uh, program review process that, uh, that I described, we were able to convince Canadians that no one was being singled out. No one had to carry a disproportionate share of the burden that every activity in Canada, whether it's national defense or health care or whatever else, nothing was going to be exempted from the attempt to put uh, society back on the responsible fiscal footing. And as a result, uh, we got tremendous buy-in from the public. Because, uh, you know, unlike the situation that's created when you say, well, there are certain people who should not have to make a contribution, immediately you create a dynamic in which you have a privileged class and, and people who are being asked to contribute. Uh, and uh, immediately then people say, well, I'm in the wrong category. I should be in the privileged class. One of the key things is don't create a privileged class. Say to everybody, this is something we have to do together. Uh, and then what the dynamic you create is that when, as inevitably will be the case, someone says, oh, well, I should be exempt from this because I'm just too important. Uh, uh, then everybody else says, well, uh, no. Actually, I'm making my contribution. I'm making my sacrifice. You have to too. And it actually uh, becomes a dynamic in which it's self-policing. It no longer falls to politicians to stand up and say, yes, you have to bear uh, your part of this too. Uh, and the, everybody else says, look, I'm willing to do this because I've been convinced that it's good for society and this is the only way forward. And no one should be exempt from this. So, you know, help out the politicians by telling them that there should be no exceptions uh, and no exemptions. Um, there are lots of other things that I could say about, um, about how Canada achieved what it did, but I think that's a good overview. And I'd rather stop now, if I may, and give you a chance to ask questions that may allow me to elucidate some points that you would find most helpful. So I'm going to stop there and invite questions, if, uh, if that's okay. Great. Uh, or 
has no legal right to be there because, of course, there are some people like that. But it, it's it's actually quite small. Um, so uh, the system works pretty well, uh, but. Um, we are going to be under tremendous demographic pressure in the next little while because uh, our, uh, our population is going to start aging faster than almost any other Western society because of the, the baby boom generation moving into retirement. Our society is going to age much faster than America, for example. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I, I would venture to say that we are at the, pretty much at the limit of what immigration can, uh, uh, can be accommodated just, there are just physical constraints. Uh, you know, 40% uh, of the immigrants to Canada settle in the, in the greater Toronto area alone. And <clears throat> it's just becoming impossible to integrate them at the rate at which they're arriving. So um, uh, I, I suspect we're going to, uh, we're not going to be able to increase immigration levels uh, uh, too much above where we are today. But the system seems to be working reasonably. So um, we have this notion of social insurance in the United States, and it includes Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, all the governments, uh, but, you know, all those uh, social programs. And um, when we look at the liability that that has created, it's rather enormous in the United States. We get estimates anywhere from 50 to a hundred trillion dollars. The government estimates are more at the lower end of that. Um, so, do you, do you have any reference points in Canada as to how you compare on that front uh, from the point of when you were at 53, now you're at 42? What are your unfunded social programs looking like? And has this reform moved that needle? Well, uh, it has, uh, the needle's moved on some things and not on others. Um, uh, take the uh, Canada Pension Plan, so our equivalent of Social Security. Uh, the chief actuary of the Canada Pension Plan uh, says that as a result of the uh, reforms in the 1990s, that the Canada Pension Plan is now solid for the next 75 years. As nothing bad happens in 75 years, they just only project out 75 years. So um, uh, we essentially fix that problem. Um, uh, public sector pensions is a rather different kettle of fish, so leaving aside public pension programs like the CPP, uh, public employees uh, of, uh, in, in a lot of Canada have uh, some uh, very significant uh, unfunded liabilities in their, uh, in their pension programs. I, I don't have a number for you, but uh, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, pretty significant. Um, uh, the um, Medicare program in Canada is for our universal uh, public health care system. Um, by uh, some measures, uh, the unfunded liability of that uh, program is uh, over a trillion uh, dollars. It's, it's a very significant number. Um, and I mentioned that uh, Governments in the Western world have three great entitlement programs, social welfare, public pensions, and uh, public health care. And uh, in uh, your reform period in the early 90s, you fixed one, social welfare. Uh, in our reform period, we fixed two, social welfare and public pensions. But um, uh, our uh, health care system remains the great unreformed entitlement program. 